ways. In spite of all of the circumstances we could ever encounter, the Lord truly is worthy to be praised. And we give God all of the glory. We give him all of the honor. We give him all of our praise. For the Lord is good. And I thank God for his goodness. God bless each and every one of you. I hope you are blessed. Continuing to walk in the realm of that blessing. As always, when we come into the house of the Lord, we come with his word in our hearts. And I ask you to join with me as we read Psalms 1 in its entirety. Psalms 1. Psalms 1. David, who declares the way of righteousness unto the Lord. Psalms 1 says, Bless is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doeth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the trap which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you. It's out of our great need for you that we will take the time before we do anything else. Come before your presence and offer our hearts to you that you might do that which only you can do. Yes. Touch hearts and change lives. Father, we thank you for your love, your kindness, your tender mercy. We thank you, Father, for how you and your great mercy has spared our moments to roll on. Someone would not afford the opportunity and they had to stand before you this very day. But Lord, we're here today we're here to declare your worth in the earth. We're here to give you worship and glory. We've come to this place of worship, Father, and gather in your name to worship you, Father. And we pray, Father, that we lift our hearts to you, that you would move, Father, in our situation, move in this congregation. Lord, you know the needs that are in this place. You know those that are connected with this association of ministry, Father, those who are in great need. Lord, you know, Father, where they are and what they need minister to their needs today. Father, I pray for a word from on high that will touch our hearts and pull us into that place we need to be. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give strength to those, Father, whose plate have taken such a blow. Father, they're fearful and fretted, Lord, and I pray that you would give them strength today, Lord. Give them power today, Lord, that they might know that the God that is on their side will never leave us, will never forsake us. You never sleep, you never slumber, you never lock your post, and we thank you that you always will be God. God in our circumstances, God in our life, God in the earth, Father. So, Lord, we pray that your will be done today. We pray, Father, that your silent will take place in our lives, Father. For that one that needs direction, give it, Lord. For that one that needs hope, grant it, Lord. For that one that's about to go through divorce and don't want to go there. Oh, God, intervene right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, we pray for the backslide today. We pray for that one that has distanced themselves from you and want to get back and don't know how. But, oh, God, we plead the blood of Jesus. Touch, heal, and deliver right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord. And we just thank you today, Lord, for doing it, Lord. Thank you for the prayers our family has been praying this week, Lord. Thank you for the needs that you're going to be, Lord. Thank you for the so 
Oh, yes, we did. 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 We did.
is my shepherd. I want for nothing. Amen. God is so good. He's worthy to be praised. Good morning. May God bless us to each and every one of you. The Lord bless and keep you is our prayer. You know, as long as he's the shepherd, you have no worry. If he's truly the shepherd, he's going to take care of his sheep. The Lord takes care of his children. He's not like some of these fathers out here. But the Lord takes care of his children. God bless you. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Worship the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. No matter what and in spite of what. There is a real enemy out there that is fighting. He's fighting the cause. But I'm telling you folks, I believe with all my heart, even in light of the message we'll preach today, I believe that we as a church must rise in power and we must fight the good fight of faith. And we're in a fight. Yes. We're in a fight. I know I listened to one candidate as he come in uh, Posing for votes, he said, we're in a fight for the soul of this nation. And I believe we're in a greater fight than for the soul of the nation. For the souls of men are being lost every day. But I believe God is raising up an army, a generation of people who turn to him wholeheartedly that he might deliver. Hope and pray you feel welcome in the house of the Lord. You feel welcome in whatever uh, you're doing. God is truly good and he's worthy to be praised. Lord is so worthy of all of our praise. It's good to be in his house. We've been studying on Wednesday nights the word of the Lord. It's been coming out of the book of John. And uh, we found out something that uh, not only did Jesus not break the Sabbath, but he fulfilled the Sabbath in bringing a true rest. The whole idea of the Sabbath day was a day of rest. And those who he healed on the Sabbath really could not embrace the Sabbath in the truest sense of the word because of their condition. And his healing them of that condition, even though they accused him of breaking the Sabbath, in many ways he was fulfilling it and bringing true rest to those that were weary, that man on his bed, that man with the blind eyes, the man with the withered hand, that woman who was hunched over over and over again. Jesus brought a greater rest to them on the Sabbath day and allow those religious folks to look at him and uh, on purpose, really, purposely uh, accuse him of breaking the Sabbath just so he could remind them that the Lord is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, he made Sabbath for man, not for him. God didn't need rest when he made the earth. He was just done making everything and he was now upholding everything that he had made on that seventh day rest. So God, who the Bible says never sleeps, he never slumbers, he's always at work on our behalf. And thank God he is. Because when we had that showdown on Mount Carmel, if God would have had his seven-day rest and not answered any of our prayers and not moving on that particular day, we wouldn't have had fire come down. But because he's never asleep, he's waiting on his prophets to call fire down. He's waiting on his people to call on him. He answers and answers mightily. And thank God that he does. I've been enjoying that study. And if you're a scholar of the book, I encourage you to read through the book of John. We're in chapter 5. We're going to look at this whole idea of him and the Father being one and how it baffled them. God's word is true and it's real. And it's so enriching to just embrace the word of God and study and go through with it. Uh, it'll be a blessing to you. I don't know where you're at in your walk with God. But one thing I do know, God is in the business of giving you as much of him as you desire. I hear people say, pray my strength in the Lord. And really, that's, that's kind of not biblical to pray because you can get as much strength as you want. And he already told you, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his, his might. His might. His might is greater than yours. So it's unbiblical to pray my strength in the Lord. You can get all the strength you want. Nothing to stop you with you. You get in the Word. You get in prayer. You will get strong. Now I know many times we pray and we ask that God would give us more of Him. But if you want more of Him, He's not hiding. He's not withholding Himself. 
He'll give you just as much as you want. I've never seen God turn down his child. If you're hungry and thirst after righteousness, the Bible says you shall be filled. I've always been impressed with those who open up their Bible and get in the Word of God. Those who show up on Bible study night and roll up their sleeves and uh, no glamour dress or none of that. Just come and get in the Word of God. I'm greater impressed with those who take the Word of God to heart and make it applicable in their life. This is real Christian living. It's not showing up Sunday. It's not just going through the Bible thing on Sunday, but having the Word of God as an enricher to our heart and a guide by which we live our life. Making adequate choices that fulfill what He's written. That's true study of the Bible. The Bible says we got to pay the most earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time they slip. And oh, the enemy is so busy wanting to pull away that which you embrace. But pay attention. We're living in a day and age where the Bible is unfolding right before us. There was a peace treaty signed a couple days ago. Our president was one that helped broker the deal between Israel and some of their allies. And now uh, a very strategic, prophetic thing has happened. It's going to point toward our times, the fulfilling of our times. We see the unrest in the streets, especially in America. The unrest that's now taking global effect. We see now where it's not even safe or popular to be a law enforcement officer. The unrest, the Bible said, when you see these things, stand in a holy place. Someone called me the other day concerned and worried that this political journey we're on now is going to unleash madness in unprecedented measure. And the unrest that's going to ensue out of this is that they're planning it already. And this particular individual kept telling me, he said, you got to be prepared, you got to be ready. But there is something breaking on the horizon. And I believe with all my heart, there is something brewing in the horizon. And I believe God is calling the people that will understand and know the times we live in to consecrate and holiness unlike never before. Prayer unlike never before. We get ready to pray. As we get ready to go before the throne of God, before we do anything else in this service, we are mindful of the fact that we are living in perilous times. The kingdom of darkness has been so penetrated that the demons are unleashed in a fervor unlike we've never seen it. We've been having it all over the world. And I'm telling you, folks, it is going to take power that only God can give us to withstand in this evil day. Jesus looked at those men and said, look, you trying to get it done, but this kind, this kind, we're dealing with this kind, y'all. This kind can only come out by my fasting and prayer, intense prayer. This kind is not going to move by you just standing up, shaking and jumping now, by you just saying a couple of things, repeat after me. No, this kind is only going to move when you get on your face before God and deny your flesh and get before God and do the business of prayer. I mean prayer that causes you, costs you something. Prayer that hurts. Prayer that causes you to agonize a little bit. We live in a day and age of such deep Christianity and the devil is going around as a real foe fighting those who stand. We need to fight them. Go before God in prayer. Sickness is wrapped with us. The plague has scared more people than ever before. People are weary and well doing. People's faith has taken a blow. I never thought I would see the day when people would allow faith to come under attack. So, but I believe with all my heart, God is opening up the doorway by which we can come to Him and come boldly. No matter where you are right now, you can come boldly to him and find grace to help, find mercy in our time of need. Our time of need is upon us. Sickness, financial devastation, marriages are under attack, children are acting up. We need God. The world is in the unrest. Only God can do it. 
Father, as we come before you tonight, today, thank you for the privilege we have to call on you. You've been good to us. And because we have the testimony in our hearts of your goodness, we come with a greater assurance that today, the weeping that has endured through the night is a preface to the joy that's going to come in the morning. The agony and the pain that we're feeling now. Oh, God, the disappointment. Our heart is embracing now. It's just a preface to the joy that will manifest in the morning. Oh, God, I pray now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would look over this place, look over this congregation, look over our membership, Lord. Those that are far and near, Lord, bring us together, Lord. Bring us more together than we ever been before. Touch hearts and change lives, Lord. Raise us up at this hour that we might be beacons of hope, Lord. Raise us up at this hour, Lord, that we might be bright lights in the darkness of the night. That those that are walking in darkness can see the way and be drawn to the Father, Lord. Father, we pray for those that are sick, those who are captivated in their illness, Lord. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would, Lord, show up and show out. Heal that body, Lord. Touch down, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for healing those, Lord. Thank you for healing marriages. Thank you, Lord, for showing the way. Thank you for opening the door. Thank you, Lord, for the way you provide. For what you give, Lord, is in the green pasture. And you restore souls and lead us in paths of righteousness. For your name's sake, Lord, it's your name on the line, Lord. Lord, I'm not worried about a name for me, not a name for this church. But, oh, God, the name of Jesus, the name by which every day and every time we come back, the name by which we stand is the name that we move and live and have our being that we're concerned about today, Lord. And for your name's sake, Lord, move in our homes, move in our land, move in this ministry, move in those that are connected with this ministry, Lord. Move in our hearts, Lord. Move in their affairs, God. We believe firmly it is in the best hands in your hands. Give over our cares to you. We give our loved ones over to you. And we believe in you to move on their behalf. Touch hearts and change lives. And we will give you the praise. We'll give you the glory. We'll give you the honor by your grace in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm still here.
Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our life is a constant resistance. There's a constant, constant desire that old man would love to prove himself. And the resistance Paul referred to here really is wrestling, we wrestle. It's opposition being in the Roman Greek era. They certainly understood what wrestling mean, for that was one of the more popular sports. And our life is riddled around as the old nature seeks to prove itself. And if it's not put to death and not dealt with and not resisted, the things your flesh desire to do and want will surface. Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It does not mean that Christians had no enemies among men. For we are exposed, and they were too, to great opposition, great persecution. But it wasn't so much men as it was the force driving them. Hear me as I say this. It's not so much people, but the spirit that's driving people. And why are you so busy getting mad at people? You need to consider what it is that's motivating them to do what they are doing. Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness, of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And why dealing with this, you will have to understand our fight is more with the spirit motivating a man to do what he's doing than the power to deal with those spirits are in high demand. Now something again, now remember, is prayer releases the power. Prayer, prayer releases the power. When we rest, Paul said it's not just flesh and blood, but there's principalities, angels divided into ranks and orders under the control of one mighty demonic force known as the devil. Now, you can't think of some little person in a red suit going around with a pitchfork waiting to stick you when you're not watching. That's not the devil. And the devil cannot be two places at one time. He's not all powerful like God. He can only be messing with one person at a time. But he has many fallen angels and imps. And he has many people who would allow him to use them. And some of y'all know all so well when somebody is being used of the devil. Because they find that last nerve. <laughs> they pinch that last nerve and find it. Deal with it. Ranking angels. There's some people that are a bigger threat to the devil. And he's sending principality, prince, demons after them. There's some people, there's no threat to him at all. He ain't bother them because they're no threat. But they that live godly, you find that opposition. You find the principalities are at work. You find that there is a certain power within the realm of those principalities where people motivated by the power of the enemy operate in a realm and boy are they not operating. Just look at our streets. Look how flooded they are with people who, are, who say they're, they're moving for one movement when really they're motivated by the most evil you can ever possess. 
And isn't that evil? They're taking people's lives, looting stores, destroying other people's harbor and property. People sweat uh, uh, for years to build up uh, uh, just a means by which they can sustain themselves and their family. And just in an instant, out of the range of somebody motivated by a demonic force, destroyed and taken away. Satan is operating in the realm of the earth and a power that the church must identify. And by the way of the Holy Spirit, get the help we need to deal with it. The rulers of darkness, not just principalities and powers, but he says rulers of darkness. Rulers, those who have authority in it, rule over the darkness. And the dark of the night is considered when he's best at work. I was raised in a home where you weren't allowed to be out at dark unless we were all out at church somewhere. I know now kids raise themselves. They about to do what they want to do. But darkness was considered the devil's time. And if you wasn't in church, you was home. At least in a home we were raised in. Some of you that was afforded the opportunity to be raised in a home where people really cared. You weren't allowed to go out in the dark of night and just have your life and do whatever you want. You was, you was called home. We weren't allowed to go far from home. And when it got dark, we showed up had to be home. Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this world. Yeah. And if you don't believe this world is in a fallen state, you go all the way back to Genesis. And you look at how a man in his offering cost him his life. Yeah. You look at a man who voiced his opinion to be right with God, cost him his life. You see then that men falling in that state was banished out of the garden because of the choice. And in, in the early angels of time, you see the Bible said it was so bad that men started calling on the name of the Lord. Things were so bad in that fallen state because the darkness had flooded the earth. A man killed a man. And Cain understood his death, the damage of what he had done. And Lamech came along with the seed of his father and he killed a man. And God gave Adam and Eve sat. And the Bible says then men begin to call on the name of the Lord. Why? Because they understood that there is a force that is fighting good. Darkness do not like the light. Paul put it this way. We're wrestling against the powers of darkness. The rulers of darkness of this world. And then we have spiritual wickedness high places. This is definitely warfare. My wife sung the song, This Means War. I wonder how many of the believers are really going to war with the spirits of darkness that is at fight in the earth and all around them. He regards each and every Christian as a soldier that is to wage war on whatever way he could and whatever way he could attack. We are to wage war. He did not say we are to take it. He said we are to wrestle against it. And he said we're not wrestling with men. That's the problem we're trying to engage physically. He said no, but we're wrestling against some stuff that is bigger than us. As I said earlier, Jesus told him, look, what you're trying to do is this kind. And long as you're trying to fight this kind, you cannot use that kind of way of doing it. This kind can only come out by fasting and by prayer. The fight is not so much with the person rather than the spirit motivating the person. So our own sinfulness, we give in and allow what evil passions of others, their pride and ambition, which is a part of that kingdom. The customs, the laws, the opinions. Oh, don't they have opinions now? He said, we got spiritual wickedness in high places. Folks, it is there to the point they are trying to promote laws and circumstances that will completely shut you down. We won't even be able to come together the way we're coming together now. 
Zoom, Facebook, all these accounts that we shut off. We're at war, war. And the spiritual wickedness is reaching up for high places. It's not by accident now that we have more people of Muslim descent trying to get into politics with a mindset that is so against Christ. It's not by accident so many atheistic minded people are dying for your vote who when they get in office will care less about you or your God. When they get in office will make sure they will do any and everything to shut your cause down and make you a welfare case dependent upon them. And never release you to the destiny by which God has called you because the thoughts the Lord said I have for you are thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And this is what is up for grabs now. Your future and your hope. We're fighting for it. We're fighting for it for our children. I got three children and I cringe at the kind of America they are going to embrace if we let this thing go and don't fight. Paul said we wrestle not. We have to fight. I want to give you an example through the word of God. All throughout the book of Acts, which is a book of action, you see the unfolding of events where the fight was on. And it was more in the spiritual realm than the physical realm, even though they fought and paid a dear price in the physical realm. But it was all in the spirit. And trust me right now, what you see unfolding in the physical realm is just a, 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 a glimpse of what's going on in the spiritual realm. And greater is to be released. All throughout the book of Acts, the unfolding of events where the fight was on. It started with a group shut up in prayer. That's a good way to be. A group shut up in prayer. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, they gladly received his word was baptized. And the same day were added 3,000 souls. Because one man prayed and gave testimony. After God moved to how Jesus had came. And the next thing you know, we got 3,000 souls that are coming to the Lord. A man come out of a prayer meeting, empowered by the Holy Ghost. Prayer released power that calls now a man that normally was timid and could not talk and didn't know the right thing to say at any given time. Now he's talking in 3,000 souls added to the church. Not very long after that, in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, we have a man who was a paralytic. He was crippled, sitting at the gate, beautiful. Peter and him going up and praying. The next thing you know, this man is healed. And those that witnessed that, when they heard the word of God, they believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. Prayer released. Next thing we know, we find Peter bathed in prayer, standing to the powers of evil and many who stood by and believed their witness. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 14, and the Bible said, and believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. Peter stood up now to the evil that has invaded the hearts of men in the land. Philip goes to Samaria. I'm just giving you a couple of examples. Philip went down to Samaria and preached Jesus to a whole city. He goes to Samaria and preaches Jesus and exercises power. Now, you're not going to preach Jesus without some power showing up. You're not going to call on Jesus without some power showing up. You're not going to go and declare his name and he don't back it up. If you go trying to preach your name, build your church, build your ministry like a lot of them are doing, there will be no power. But there's power in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, at that name, every knee bow, every tongue confess. It's at that name, demons tremble. They don't care nothing about you. They don't care nothing about your auntie and your uncle. But whosoever call on the name of the Lord, there's power in that name. And when Philip went down to Samaria, he knew more than enough that I don't need to mention my name. I don't need to mention these apostles. Preach Christ to these people. These people need to know who Jesus is. These people need to know that Jesus. Got 
Jesus. We got a mayor need to know Jesus. We got a city need to know Jesus. We got a state need to know Jesus. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw unto me. If I be lifted up, lift it up. Peter went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which he said. You know why? Because upon hearing, they saw our miracles, unclean spirits. He exercised power, real power. And I don't know about you, but I want some real power in my life. I want some real power that will exercise over all of the demonic activities in the earth. The Bible says, in verse 7, many, 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 many that were possessed with them. Many. He don't even give us a number, but he says many. You know why? So many was coming. Maybe he didn't have time to count them all. All he could do was say many. Many that was coming. And look at verse 8. There was great joy in the city. Great joy in that city. God was moving so in the book of Acts that the Bible said they were dispersed. And the Bible said they went preaching everywhere. They went preaching Christ everywhere. Philip had went down to Samaria. Peter was over here. But they were over there. God was moving. Stephen was over there. He was being mildly, but God was being exalted. Peter, Acts chapter 9, verse 34, comes to Aeneas. He looks what he tells him. Jesus Christ makes you whole. Make you bed up, man. The Bible said he arose immediately. Now look what this did for those who were watching. All that dwelt in Lydia and Sharon saw him, but they turned to the Lord. Does that happen when people see you? Do they turn to the Lord? Or do they go further from you? Do they see you and say, I don't want nothing to do with that Jesus you have? When they saw a miracle worked in this person's life, when they saw how God had changed his life, and yes, I still believe in the changing power of God. I believe God will change your life. And if you're not letting God change your life, the problem is not with God, it's you, I guarantee you. Because he can change your life. He can make you the wife you need to be. He can make you the husband you need to be. He can take the bitterness out of you and make it sweet. He can take the anger out of you and put joy down in there. He can take the unforgiveness out of you and turn it all around. He can take your broken life and put it back together again. And all of those pieces you thought that were shattered to the point they can be a little Oh, wake up in here today. Immediately after that, Peter is brought to a house where a dead woman is. In Acts chapter 9, verse 40. I'm trying to show you what power of prayer was releasing in their day. Peter is brought to this house where this dead woman is. Peter goes. And he kind of must have remembered what Jesus did. He put them all out. And he had a one-on-one -on -one talk with God. He put them all out. That's what it means when it says Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And then sometimes you might want to engage people. You might need to go and just get before God yourself. And he turned to the woman body and said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes. He gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he called the saints and widows, he presented her, not in that dead state they call him to her in. He presented her alive. Power. Release. And the Bible says it was known all throughout Joppa. And here we are again, King count Many can't give account to this. All we know is many believe in the Lord. I want to show you, as I showed you from example throughout the book of Acts, and this, this is just the surface of it, that in the early days of the church, God demonstrated his power 
through those who pray. None of these folks got this kind of power on their own. This kind of power didn't just fall in their lap. They paid a dear price for this. And while you're trying to be known with men, they were seeking to be known with God. And you got to have one or the other. You're not going to have two. You're not going to be known of men and known of God. You're going to have to do the labor and it's time consuming. But those that give them the presence of the Lord will find great peace. You'll also find great power. Great power. In the early church, God demonstrated his power through those who prayed. And it came out of those who came out of the upper room, touching hearts and changing lives. It's the norm. Prayer was the norm. It was the foundation that moved them in ministry. Paul said, look, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, he said, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. It's twofold there, in word and in power. It's good to have the word. It's good to know the word. It's good to have all of that articulate Greek and Hebrew and know that you can really get the, the theology of it, how to exegete a verse properly, all of that stuff is good. I love to get people that know it. I love to try to learn some of it myself. I have books and programs that I seek to learn and know more. I'm constantly learning. I never can know enough. But folks, that's not the vein of what we do. The vein of what we do is to have power. You need power in the Holy Ghost. And Paul said, when our gospel came unto you, it was not in word only. Yes, you need to know the word. You need to know your Bible. You need to be in that word. But you need power now. You got to deal with spiritual wickedness in high places. You need power. You need power. You need power. He said, my gospel came. My gospel came not only you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. And in much assurance, as you know, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. I love the way Paul put this. Because what he relied on, and they knew it. Because he knew the letter. He could speak a couple of languages, if I remember him right. He had sat at the feet of some of the most educated people, if I remember him right. And when he wanted to brag about being a Hebrew, he said, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That's me, y'all. He said, of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he said, you can follow me. And, and, and he used the word blameless. That means you can articulate the law and the letter to the most unique critique you want and find no flaw in him. But he said, what those things that were gained for me, I count loss because I know something about the power of God that can't be compared to letter. The letter killing, but the spirit brings life. And if you get the word and don't get no spirit, it's going to choke you out. And many of people in our church today are trying to live the spirit to your life. And they have not been by way of the water. They have not been by way of the spirit. They have not been engulfed with the Holy Ghost. They can't pray one hour with you. You can't give them the call in the name of the Lord for 30 minutes because they don't have the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. You need power that's going to help you in the morning. You need power that's going to get you going when everybody else walk away. You'll still stand there and fight the good fight of faith. You need power that whether you know that you're really going to theology, you will be able to say, Jesus, that's more than enough. Jesus, my comedy keeper. Jesus, my way maker. There is a name of every name. Hallelujah. I love to sing his praise. It's Jesus in the morning. It's Jesus in the evening. And the Bible said he'll give you power. Somebody have a power. power. That's what we need. That's what we're hurting for. Paul depended on the power of God. Let me get through this. He depended on the power of God. Not his education. Nobody was more educated than him. But he needed that which God gave only through prayer. Yeah. And he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, he said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words. Mm -hmm. Now, if anybody knew words that could entice people, it was Paul. Folks, the man had 12 languages. Wow. That's, that's, that's enough right now to get in a crowd of people and go to talking at least three of them and make them think you know something. I heard a preacher one time, he said thank you in about 15, 20 different languages. Very impressive. 
thank you. And we stood there, and I, I know he had to practice that thing to know it. In about 15 different languages, he said thank you. 15 different languages, I was impressed. Paul knew these languages so good. He could easily give us some Hebrew background and give us some enticing words. Man's wisdom, you know how men love to hear. He can use big words, they think you're educated. They respect you better for some reason or something. They tend to think that you know something. Uh, sometimes the greed mess you up more than help you up. Some of these folks go and get a degree and look like they get worse. Just look at our Congress. We've educated ourselves right out of the knowledge of God, haven't we? Now they think they're doing something. They think they're smart. Now they say the Pledge of Allegiance and don't want to say a nation under God. Don't want to give God his due. Don't want to give God no respect. And if they had their way, we wouldn't even have prayer. We wouldn't even acknowledge God, he said, because man has become his own God. Look how educated we are. My granddaddy with his third grade education used to tell me, baby, ain't no food like an educated food. I believe he knew something. Some of our generation now, I think education has ruined us. Paul said, look, my speech, my preaching, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith may take a stand. Because this is going to stand, but I don't want you standing in the wisdom of men. Because the wisdom of men will fail. The wisdom of man, the Bible said the ways of a man are right in his own line. God searched the heart. And if your faith is standing in the wisdom of men, what men build you up to believe, you're going to stumble and fall in the testing time. Because God is going to take you to a realm of the spirit where that little knowledge of man is not going to be able to hold you together. It's tragic when we see churches full of a man's faith. And when that man's faith crumbles before their eyes, their faith crumbles. Paul said, I don't want your faith to stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Don't kid yourself. We are in dire need of the power. And unless God empowers us, we are in trouble. Remember, Jesus was our example. The prayer life of Jesus is a great study. And remember, those guys that was around Jesus, they didn't ask, Lord, teach me how to work a miracle. They didn't ask, Lord, teach me how to stand up to these religious people and argue with them. They didn't ask, teach us how to make bread and, and, and feed thousands of people. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. This is serious. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray like John called his disciples, like we see you doing. Because we see you stealing away. We see you moving off to yourself to be with the Father. We see you spending time, quality time, in the presence of God. Teach us to pray. Of all the things they could have asked him to do, they said, Lord, you teach us to pray. Show me how to call on your name. And folks, in my early days, I used to moan this, Lord, teach me how to pray. I started catching so much hell, I stopped saying that. It drove me to my knees where people were acting, where things are going. And you know what? It's never let up. I am constantly being pushed on my knees. You want to learn how to pray? Ask God to teach you to pray. Watch what he do. Watch the hell that will come. Watch how things will start moving, kind of acting to you. You'll start getting on your face before God. And when you understand your need, you'll go to God. You won't go to the doctor. You won't go to the bank. You won't wait on a lawyer. You'll call on the name of the Lord. Because God do not want no children that will not trust him. And prayer is the avenue by which we unfold our lead deeds to God. And let God know that what we need. That's what he can do for us that we can't do for ourselves. When we stand in the wisdom of men, it will fail every time. Jesus stood in a power that was so magnanimous. In Isaiah 61 and 1, the prophet prophesied that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is power, folks. If the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, there's a power that will change everything. 
He'll take the thing in you that you think cannot be used and use it. Isaiah said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has, there's another word for that word anointed means he's empowered me to preach the gospel. Good tidings, that's the gospel. To the meek, he has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That's power. That's enabling power he didn't have that he needed. And I'm telling you, Jesus stood in the midst of those religious folks and opened the scroll up to this very passage and said, look here, this day this is fulfilled. I've been empowered. I want to point out what I feel is essential to anyone who desires to be useful in this day. If you're just passing through, then I know you probably maybe I'm turned off by now. But if you desire to really be useful in this day, I want to give you what I call the heart of this message right now. The points that will help you to be effective and useful in this day. And if you follow what I'm about to say and show you as spelled out in the word of God, you will be more effective than you've ever been before. And you will find power. Power you never thought you could walk in. Power you never thought you had. The greater one is on the inside. Number one, you got to know the word of God. In order to know the word of God, you got to be in it. It is the knowing of God's word that enables you to pray the word of God and gives you the mind of God. I, 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 I poised to ask how many people by show of hands spent some quality time in the word this week. One time I was in a, in a church where a pastor said, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to make people laugh, so I'm not going to ask them who read the Bible. Because some people in the presence of others don't want nobody to know they are as calm the way they are and not where they need to be or should be. So they will, they will, they will pretend upon the truth rather than say, I'm not there. And if you're not there, what is your reason? What is keeping you from getting in the word of God? It is the knowing of the word of God that's going to help you to know how to pray. It's the knowing of the word of God that is going to condition your mind for the times in which we live in. And my friend, if you don't believe we're living in these kind of times, then you are blinded to what's going on out there. And the reality and the truth is, unless we know the word of God, we will not be able to pray the mind of God. Because it is there where the mind of God is unveiled. John 6, 63. He said, it's the spirit, spirit that quickened it. The flesh profited nothing. But the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. In the Great Commission, the Great Commission, Jesus employed the teacher who would teach the world. He would teach them the word. Remember he said, go out in all the world and teach them, make disciples, teach them the word that they might obey it. Do you know the word of God? Read it. Study it. Memorize it. Hide it in your heart like David did. It will come up in time to need. You will be amazed at what will come up because you stored it in there. You'd be surprised how your whole conversation with people and all of a sudden passages of scripture will come up and you'll be able to share with them. Folks, I've experienced this only because of interaction in the word of God and conversing with people. All of a sudden the Holy Spirit triggers the right word and the right person to say. And all of a sudden what come up? Benefits. Touch lives. Change hearts. That's what we're all about. Hide it in your heart. It will come up in times of need. Read it to those around you. Fill your children's heart with the word. Proverbs told us, Solomon said, you train them up in the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. That's a spiritual child as well. It's not just a child, a small infant. Bathed in Christ need to be in the word. The Bible said that you should desire to sense him milk of the word. That they might grow thereby. Now those of you who 
who understand and know about babies, you know when a baby is born, you don't feed the baby the same food you eat. You give the baby that which their stomach can handle and that that can digest and grow on. I don't give my eight-month-old baby a piece of steak. We give them that which their stomach can handle. And a lot of our spiritual children need to be trained. They need training. Our churches should be a training center where we train and teach people in the way they should go. As I tell you, for too much of what's going on, too many are coming in and going out and just doing what they want. They're not going in the way they should go. Number one, know the word. Number two, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. There is no substitution for many of people, hear me as I say this, are making their attempt to live the Spirit-filled life having not been filled by the Spirit. And now we got everybody saying they're Spirit-filled. Baptists, Catholics, everybody saying they're Spirit-filled. Everybody said, well, there are signs, there's evidence that follow those that are spirit-filled. It's not just a touch you feel and fall out. No, it's a change that comes where power to live a life you couldn't live before is available to you, given to you. The Lord said in Luke 24 and 49, he said, look, y'all, I'm going to send the promise of my Father upon you. But, tarry ye in Jerusalem. I know you know all this word. I know you've been around me. You're itching and ready to go, but wait till you get some power. Wait till you get some power. Because when you go, it's going to mean something. When you go, it's going to be effective. When they go, they're going to fizzle out because they're going in their strength and their power. And it's like gas in a car. It's going to run out. Unless you pump more gas in, it ain't going to go no more. The Lord said, you go and you tarry in Jerusalem. Wait until you be endured with power from on high. Don't get mama made. Get some power from on high. Don't be a mama made preacher. That's what my former pastor used to tell me. Don't be mama made. Be God made. Get power from on high. Nobody can turn that off. All this time in their lives, they had word, but no power. And in order to deal with the enemy, you need power from on high. The power that exercises higher power than the operating in the earth realm. What's operating in the earth realm is powerful. But that which is going to come down from on high is greater. Somebody say greater. That which comes down from on high is greater than any demon force. Greater than any power, any principality. You've heard it. 
John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. People don't get the Holy Ghost no more. This is the problem, man. People don't get the Holy Ghost no more. People don't want to even do nothing now. People don't want to do anything that makes it look like they're calling on God to fill them with this brother. But I'm telling you, y'all, we need to get back to calling on the Lord. We need to get back to soul-searching prayer that causes the Holy Spirit of God to come in our midst. The Holy Ghost is the power that we need operating in our lives and in our church today. Christ Church today had the same need. This new concept of church today where we downplay the power for a formula. Is that not sad? We downplay the power for a formula. The Bible said they're denying the power thereof. Downplay for a formula. We must get back to the power. Zechariah 4 and 6. This is the word of the Lord under Zerubbabel. It's not by power, not by mind, nor by man's power, but by my spirit, the word spirit there, said the Lord. If we're going to be affected in this day, you're going to have to have the Holy Spirit of God. Number one, you got to know the word. Number two, you got to be filled with the presence of God. And then number three, and I'm about to close, you got to pray. Nothing takes the place of prayer. You can't pray enough. You can't pray enough. You can't pray enough. A doorway opened up. I was meeting with a man and we were having breakfast. The Lord told me, he said, don't eat no more. Come pray. Don't eat no more. Come pray. I didn't argue with God one bit. He didn't neither. So I understand. The times we're in, what I deal with in my own heart, what we deal with in this church. There's so many needs around here. There's so many people who need to get a fresh grip on their faith with God. Yes. The Lord said, pray. Pray. And then I'm telling you, prayer will take you some places. And you, you get to pray and the devil's going to talk in your ear while you're praying. I know you spiritually don't have to you. But he's going to talk in your ear and say, that don't mean nothing. God ain't going to do that. God ain't going to do that. But folks, I'm telling you, God says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails nothing. Nothing takes the place of actually engaging in prayer. You have to seek the Lord. Do you hear me? It's in the imperative when the early church came together for the purpose of prayer. Things change. In Acts chapter 1 verse 14, this is where it gets good. The Bible said they continue with one accord in prayer and supplications with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Notice the Bible said they were in one accord in prayer. They were all in agreement that we need to come together and we need to pray. And if we call on God, something is going to happen. So the Bible said they continue with this one thing in prayer. Now let me tell you something, folks. The only reason we have what Acts chapter 2 has declared the move yet. The only reason why we have what happened in Acts chapter 2 is because what happened in chapter 1. We would have never got to chapter 2 if we had not got to chapter 1. What do you mean, preacher? We would have never got nowhere had the church not come together and got on their knees before God. Nothing is going to get done until we pray. The only reason we have Acts chapter 2 and the mighty Russian wind coming in is because they pray
prayer. It was released in prayer. David said in Psalms 27 and 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy. Oh, you know, Lord. Have mercy on me. Answer me. That's some very demanding stuff there. Look at that verse again. David said, Hear, O Lord, when I cry, have mercy on me. And answer me. When you said, Seek your face, it was already dissolved in my heart. Your face, Lord, I'm going to seek. I look around at this empty building. I want the Holy Spirit of God. 
pray for those who are sick, those who are dealing with this dreadful disease. Father, so many of my friends and people I know of have come in contact. Father, I pray your grace. Bring them through. Bring them through. For your name's sake. We'll give you the praise. Glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Happy birthday. Some of you have celebrated birthdays. God bless you. Happy birthday. The Lord bless and keep you is our prayer. I'm so glad to hear brother tell me they celebrated 29 years of marriage. 29 years of marriage. What a blessing it is. God bless you. Pray one for another as we pray for you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's so good to see each and every one.